Hello, and welcome to the Sexy and Being Sessions. I'm Alex Pruitt, a certified sex, love, and relationship coach and reality guide. I work with men, women, and couples plus who want to transform their old patterns, pain, and beliefs so they can create thriving relationships that are deeply connected, playful, and fulfilling within themselves and with others. Today, I'm joined by the splendiferous Rachel Rose, if you want to go ahead and introduce yourself. Aw, splendiferous. Yeah. Best compliment I've ever had. <laughs> I am Rachel Rose. I am a life coach uh, with a master's degree in psychology that specializes in trauma and PTSD, specifically with women who have experienced toxic, narcissistic, or domestic violence within their relationships and moving on after their abuse beautiful i love that offering by the way that is a <laughs> amazing space to be able to give to women or anyone really <laughs> thank you um and so today our topic is unbound unwinding after abuse and mm -hmm. to me this comes up um because at some point very early on in my personal journey after being in a very abusive relationship emotionally and mentally, I found myself feeling like I was stuck in this box, right? Mm -hmm. And I actually got this really clear image in my third eye, imaginal space, whatever you want to call it, of being trapped in this very awkward position that was very, very uncomfortable within this box and at some point I asked myself okay like what is this box made of and I realized it was made of all these little tiny slips of paper and all these little pieces of paper were the ideals the expectations the judgments that my partner at that time had about his ideal partner or what my perception of those things were based on little inputs of information over the course of our relationship and there was there was more things that came to fruition during that day but at the end of that day I actually allowed myself the space of realizing this box is only made of paper and mm -hmm. just little slips of it right yeah. It's not very thick. It's not very strong. And the only thing holding me in this box is myself. Mm -hmm. And so I allowed myself to go through the visualization of breaking out of the box, all the paper fluttering down around me. And it was one of the first times I recall really feeling free as far as like a set of sensations and emotions coming up within my body and just being like, the, the sky is the limit on what I can be and I can create and nothing else and no one else has to hold me in this box. Yeah. So that's, that's, there's this binding and winding that can happen around us through the process of being in abusive relationships or even being abusive to ourselves. Yeah. And that's kind of what I want to talk about here today. And allowing the space and the openness and the trust and safety within our own beings to unwind. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that, that unwinding process isn't going to just be, you know, like simple and easy, like, Oh, I'm unwinding. I've got a, I've got a roll going. You're going to come across knots and cricks and, cuts and whatever along the way and I know exactly what you mean about this box um, I call it my open door prison cell because mm -hmm. the way I like to describe it is you, you know there's the the heaven or the the ideal world outside but with that comes you know trust issues, happiness, sadness, you name it. It's almost like the inverse of Pandora's box. Mm -hmm. Inside this, this, this prison cell that doesn't have a door that you could leave whenever you want 
is safety and security in the familiar. Yes. It is, in many cases, you could say, uh, the, I first learned this, um, what I'm explaining to you guys, using uh, heaven, you know, the, the devil and, and angel scenario. So usually the, in the, the context that I learned it in, it was that the sinner is inside of this prison cell and they're choosing to be there. And what happens is it's limiting. You're limiting yourself and you're limiting the exchanges you can have with the outside world. And in most cases, we're not aware that there is no door. We just see bars on all four sides and we don't realize that there's any way out. And then even if we do realize that there is, sometimes we still choose to stay there. And, you know, that's your prerogative. I'm not going to tell you what is right or wrong. Um, because the outside world is, is very scary. Challenging that pain and that trauma of what, in Alex's case, she was describing all of the things that uh, your, your ex-partner put on you as like a weight mm -hmm. that was that was creating your cage and you know same goes for anyone else so once you leave that cage you have to face the reality of those things and let them go or that outside world will turn into pandora's box and all the famine pain and sadness will reap onto you if, if you're still holding on to that it's like a a ball and chain you never truly left the prison you just got the ability to go and walk around with that ball and chain on you well one of the the images i keep getting coming to mind consistently as you've been talking is it's something i read a long time ago i think it might be in the book the happiness hypothesis hypothesis there we go mm -hmm. if alex can word today um <laughs> then but it's like I know the cover image on the book is like an elephant swimming or something like that but it ends up telling this story about like when they take like newborn baby elephants to domesticate them and oh, train them oh, right yeah. oh. they literally use like a flimsy rope at that age it prevents the elephant from being able to break away mm -hmm. The thing is, like, at the point that the elephant is now an adult, they still are only using this teeny tiny rope. The elephant could so easily, like, even take and toss a human trainer in the size comparison and the, like, difference in their strength, right? Mm -hmm. But they still keep thinking that they are confined by this rope. And that can happen so easily in our relationships, and especially when abuse cycles start happening when we're younger yes right that rope or proverbial chain can seem to get bigger and heavier even though we've far exceeded its strength yes and i i want to emphasize as well uh everything that alex is saying right now even once we remove the ropes or the person, whoever it is that was creating this turmoil and abuse towards us, we can still have a phantom rope. Mm -hmm. Like, let's say you left your abuser. It's been 10 years. But you're still unhealed by it because that phantom rope still exists. It's still binding you. Mm -hmm. And that is, unfortunately a very common reality for a lot of people who have gone through toxic relationships, narcissistic abuse, or domestic violence is a you know, partnership that, that, or, or, uh, in most cases, a uh, partnership or parents, something that happened in their childhood, they stick with us like a, like a growth. I like to call them. Um, and, if that's okay. If, you know, we're 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 gonna have that wound there the rest of our lives. It's always gonna be there. 
but we can heal it so that scar tissue covers it up. So, you know, it's always there, but it's now healed. So you can, it's a reminder, not if it gets touched the wrong way, it's going to start bleeding again. Mm -hmm. And it's okay if it's been 10 years too, if that, that just means that's how long the providence was for you to step into your power again. Whatever you choose to leave your box is your is when you leave your box. And sometimes you get pushed out of your box. <laughs> that is very true. <laughs> Agreed. Thank you. Those, those those tower moments and dark nights of the soul. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> definitely. And you know, a lot of the uh, the women that I work with, um. There's there's not only a reluctance to leaving that box, even though they're being pushed out, but one of the biggest reasons that women get pushed out of that box, even when they're not really ready or have the support system to do it, is because they have children. Mm -hmm. And they don't really have a choice to stay in that box. They they want to represent what is, you know, the lessons that they want to teach and put on their children. They don't want to see their children falling into the same patterns that they're having. And I think, so, I think one of the really important things, right? And this is in me being a mother, right? And this path and healing journey for myself and processing through so much abuse, so much grief, all these things happened when my son, like it started around the time my son was eight months old, at least as far as the big catastrophic event um but it's coming back to your intention mm -hmm. and for me that was through that catastrophic event I realized oh this isn't just like my partner being an asshole <laughs> right yeah there's patterns within me that feel so familiar and so familiar in what is coming up here Mm -hmm. Even if it hasn't looked exactly the same way. Mm -hmm. And the only common denominator between any of those people or patterns is me. So like, what is it that I need to heal through? And I don't want to pass these on to my son. Mm -hmm. And so being able to come back to like, what my intention was of wanting to heal in myself, but also not wanting to pass those on was crucial for me through that time. And it, it gave me my sort of North star yeah. that I was following because it could get really hard at points. And especially when those harder emotions are sensations or narratives are coming up about our life and our existence, our value, right? Mm -hmm. Being able to like proverbially look up and still see my North Star, even if none of the rest of it makes sense, was immensely helpful and valuable in that. So having your intention, right? And if you don't know what your intention is, like you can literally just ask the question, like, what is the intention I need to have that's in best service to my life right now? Mm -hmm. And see what comes in. See if there's a set of words that come in. If there's an image, right? Yeah. Like, listen to those things because that is part of your intuition. Yeah. It's so important. Um, intuition, one of the ways that I look at it, I love that you said that. Um, you could call it the universe as well. It's what I like to call my intuition mm -hmm. um, outside of just the universe being the universe. Um, but something I say to myself about my intuition or the universe, I call it, um, is listen to the universe when it whispers. Don't wait around for it to scream. Mm -hmm. Women 
and science has has you know studies have been done on this that to corroborate this hypothesis is that women we're at a we we function in our biology at a higher frequency than men do because we're womb carriers we have the ability to create life men biologically do not have that ability and because of that ability we have higher intuition we can feel it within our bodies when our partner is being unfaithful or when mm -hmm. our you know something's wrong with my child we feel it inside of us and that intuition and we've been told by you know social media or you know the masses or whatever um, we're conditioned to, to to say that we need to not listen to it, that it makes us hysterical. Mm -hmm. When in reality, our intuition is speaking to us. Listen, listen, something's not right here. Yeah, and that's, to me, part of that conditioning comes in very heavily around the narratives that emotions are a weakness. Right. That like mm -hmm. you need to be stoic, like you don't have feelings. Right. Which has been more directly aimed at males in our society. Mm -hmm. But I know in my experience that bled over like I, I had chunks of years, like multiple years. I think there was a point I went like four years without crying at all. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's for me, crying and anger were two of the bigger emotions that became immensely unsafe to feel and be but that also drastically watered down my ability to listen to my intuition because I thought the crying and the anger like were just nonsense right yeah but they I'm carry just being hormonal or something like that <clears throat> yeah no and there, there are those things oh like she's probably just PMSing that is a yep. dismissal Yep. of your own intuition like maybe at that time of the month you're just more in tune with what's going on around you mm -hmm. right there and I'm sure there's theories and things around that or philosophies that I'm not 100% aware of right mm -hmm. but yeah. being you're like you're literally in this cycle of your body is shedding and letting go for mm -hmm. the month when you are on your period and of course that is a great opportunity to go through the uh the death cycles the the winter the the fall and letting go mm -hmm. even just on a monthly basis and maybe it was you didn't let yourself cry all month and now like those tears want to come up or that anger wants to come up and like yep. Hopefully you're not taking that out on the people around you, right? Because that can create other situations, abuse in yeah. its own right. But and like, know that there's wisdom in those things. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And even if it is coming out in anger and you are taking it out on other people, realizing that and changing is it, it's okay. Mm -hmm. There's no shame in unintentionally harming others because of unhealed trauma. Mm -hmm. But once you are aware of it, doing your due diligence to make sure that you're not anymore is very important. Yeah. Well, that and being able to take accountability for your actions, right? I have a young yeah. son. I get triggered. There is sometimes where like I feel myself put down a wall emotionally because part of me is trying to protect him because I don't want to yell at him. Other times there's times where like I like increase the like depth of my voice and I can tell when it scares him. Right? Yeah. And I don't necessarily like doing that. There's a very strong narrative story that I've been working with for many years now around not being the thing that causes hurt or harm, mm -hmm. right? And what those things look like to me. But in that, it's being willing, if you have caused hurt or harm in another person, to listen, 
right? Mm -hmm. To take your own accountability and your own responsibility in that. That doesn't mean you take all of it, right? Yeah. But it means you, you give yourself that compassion of where you were at. You can also have compassion for the other person. And the more you give yourself that, the easier it is. It's more of an overflow versus mm -hmm. working out of a drain bucket. Yes. It's, it's important also to know, or I guess um, not fixate on how much a part of it you were versus other people. So mm -hmm. being like, you know, they were 80% of the problem. I was only 20% of the problem. That doesn't serve anybody. No. It does not matter how big or small your role in the problem was mm -hmm. just knowing that you were a part of it and other people were too, and not trying to, to villainize anyone, including yourself. Yeah. Cause you, it could be the inverse of that. And you could be saying, Oh, you know, they were going through all of this and that and that. And so like, I was such a bigger problem. Mm -hmm. That's, that's not the point. Just accept that you're a part of it and kind of, I like to say, let, let it roll off you like water off a duck's back. Don't I let also, it stick to you. I also like the idea, and I learned this from um, some Dan Miller trainings I went through as communication courses through my last corporate job. Um, but it pretty much comes down to the idea that like, okay, if there is a conflict, arising between two people, each of those people have their own 100% responsibility in the way they choose to show up or take accountability for their actions. Mm -hmm. And that like, it's, there's not, there's not the percentage divides, right? You each are a hundred percent responsible. Yeah. So what, what can you shift in like your own boundaries. Like I've talked about this a few times, but mm -hmm. my ex-husband used to get a hold of me and he'd go into directly blaming me, name calling mm -hmm. and all these things. I would tell him, don't say those things to me. Right. Yeah. I would tell him I'm not okay with being talked to that way, but then I would stay on the phone with him. Yes. And I would continue to be there taking it rather than saying, look, when you decide to calm down, I'm happy to talk, right? Mm -hmm. Or even just being like, I need a break. Mm -hmm. And that, that was really hard for me to do because I also had these other narratives in there that like other people's needs mattered more. And if I was ending that call when he was in this like painful state, for himself that like I was being neglectful. Yeah. And that's the ultimate thing in that I was giving myself care. Mm -hmm. His responsibility is giving himself care in that situation. Yes. And boundaries are not just what you hold towards other people. Having personal boundaries as well um, is important as well. Something that happened with my ex-husband which I had to kind of force on myself a boundary of was when we would get in an argument and I'm, I'm a very, um, you know, I will, I will stand up for myself. So when he's telling me, you know, it's my fault, I did this, this and that, I'd be like, absolutely not. Do not, do not put that on me. That was not me. That, mm -hmm. that was, that was, you're doing that to yourself or something like that. His response nine times out of 10 would be, oh yeah, it's all my fault. Everything's my fault. I should go kill myself. Mm -hmm. And for, for over a year, I would not leave the argument until he could convince me that he wouldn't hurt himself. Yeah. And he did, I didn't have to communicate any of this and be like, please tell me you won't do it. I had to feel like he wasn't gonna. Yeah. And so I wasn't setting any boundaries for myself. And at some point I, I stopped and I challenged him on his words in many cases. I mean, I didn't, 
I figured out it was an empty threat. Mm-hmm. And so I don't recommend you just abandon someone who says that if you if you don't think it's an empty threat. You know, if you're going to walk away, a good idea in that situation, if, you, if you're concerned, they're going to call call someone to go, you know, call the ambulance, call the police, have them go show up to that person to make sure and then get yourself away. Yeah, that was not necessary in my case. Um, and I learned that in this moment when I finally said, I'm sorry you feel that way. When you're ready to talk about this, I'll be here. And I walked away. Mm -hmm. And that was a boundary I did for myself. And I I will 100% tell you right now, I did not do that without shaking, full-on panic attack, and in tears. Mm -hmm. It was not easy the first time I did that. Um, but I had to do that for myself and my boundaries for myself. Yeah, no. And that, that is a completely legitimate boundary to set, Mm -hmm. right? I I've been in similar situations with people self-harming, whether with alcohol or drug use or, Mm -hmm. um, cutting or death threats. And Mm -hmm. I would say if you like if they are using that as a threat to keep you engaged Mm -hmm. it is probably a good idea to just step away call somebody maybe like you don't want to call the police sure yeah right or an ambulance right call their family friend yeah a friend somebody else who can be there to support them because that doesn't have to be you. And especially if it's at a point where you have decided to end mm-hmm. a relationship. Yeah. And this is going on. Um, I actually had an instance with a partner a long time ago where I I couldn't be in the relationship anymore. It, it was not serving. It was very toxic. And it took him a, like throughout the day to realize I was actually serious. He thought I was just giving threats. I'm not the type of person to say I'm going to end something unless I'm Mm -hmm. actually going to end it. Yeah. And so as it settled in for him, as I was packing to move out all these things, it set in more for him. This is real. Yeah. And he decided to go. I like I had a headache because I've been crying off and on all day. He decided to go take the rest of the bottle of etc migraine and probably over 20 doses of this medication and he got to the point where he was like puking white foam and stumbling and like slamming into the refrigerator and I mm-hmm. asked his cousin who was living with us at the time if they could take him to the hospital mm-hmm. because I I needed to focus on this like I could tell this was a cry for help for um, him, right? Mm -hmm. I also didn't want him causing himself more harm Mm -hmm. in this situation, but staying staying at our house probably was not a great option, especially because he'd already been drinking on top of that as well. Yeah. But in that instance, his cousin looked at me and was like, oh, I'm not going to do that. (laughs) I was just like, okay, I think I got a hold of his mom even. And his mom was like, well, I'm not going to do that. I have tests or something in her schedule tomorrow. And I was like, I was a little bit baffled by the lack of these other connections in his life stepping up. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I ended up taking him to the hospital. I ended up staying there. But he also consistently kept asking me through this experience, oh, well, in a month, can we go on a date again? And for me, that said a solid no. Like, if you were going to go through the process of trying to kill yourself because this relationship is over, Mm -hmm. then it's definitely a no. Yeah. And it was already at a point of no, no going back for me. Yeah. And that was just the case there. But, like, it, it was interesting to see and that's like 
I ended up making the choice in that night to stay there at the hospital because when I wasn't in the room, he would get defiant with the doctors and they actually told him several times, like, if you're not cooperating, we will call the cops. This is a suicide attempt, (laughs) in our opinion. Mm -hmm. And like that part for me, I didn't want him having more harm. Like I didn't want him to, to be experiencing that amount of pain. I just couldn't be there Mm -hmm. any longer. And that, that was fine on my part. Like that, that was the move I needed to make for myself. And like, I carry no shame about that. I don't carry guilt about him having made the choice to down that many Excedrin on top of drinking. Like those, those were his actions. Yes. Yeah. And that can be a hard thing, especially when this person is saying, I'm doing this because you made me feel this thing. Mm -hmm. Every other person is responsible for their own feelings. (laughs) And, and it, it can look different for every situation as well. And your reaction to it can be different as well. Mm -hmm. In my case, um, I was in another country married to my partner. And when I left him, I had to come back to my own country. Um, And in that process, by the time I had gone on the plane and then landed in my own country, he was already in prison. Mm -hmm. And his reaction was, you know, it was my fault. He robbed places and chased after me with loaded weapons, um, and got caught. Um, and my response to it was to post his bail, call his family, pay for them to take the train all the way up to him to get him and bring him back to his hometown. Because I understood that I was leaving. That was hard mm-hmm. for him. I do love him. And his, and it, that was for me. Yeah. I didn't give him the money just because I loved him. I loved, I, I loved him, yes. But I also paid for all of that to let go. That was my, this is the last I will ever give to you. And this is the last you'll see of me. Mm-hmm. And would I have loved to have been able to let go without having to fork over that kind of money? Yes. Did I need to for myself? Also, yes. Mm-hmm. Because just you know, what it looks like when you're, when you're leaving, my answer was still no. That $2,000 that I did, I gave him to post his bail. It wasn't a hint to him that he had a chance left or that I was fighting for something. Mm -hmm. That was my way of letting go. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Oh, go for it. (laughs) I was just going to say that even in that, right, there's, there's a gift you're giving yourself. There's also a gift you're giving him. Mm -hmm. And like it, we end up, ending these toxic relationships in such like tremulous ways yeah torrents like chaotic like I keep seeing like tornadoes and like oh yeah catastrophes yeah catastrophic events and they don't have to be like when you get down to the core of it like a lot Mm -hmm. of the time it just wasn't a good match anymore yeah you get attachment wounds and all these things and narratives <laughs> mixed mm-hmm. in the bowl and it it becomes a, a very messy, messy, mm-hmm. bubbling, toxic soup. Um, <laughs> but that, no, it's, I mean, my ex-husband ended up cheating on me multiple times, lying directly to my face. Like, even though I was giving him out all along the way, saying, like, if you don't want to be here, you don't have to be. Mm -hmm. and there was some inner conflict in him where he needed to go out behind my back right yeah versus when when asked directly are are you sleeping with this person Mm -hmm. telling me no like that's I wasn't screaming at him right Mm -hmm. but 
there was something in defense on his side. And even when I got hard evidence, he still tried to deny what had happened. And that, that next day I realized, okay, like where we're living, he doesn't have a whole lot of community built up or connections. And I was like, look, like, if you want to like leave kindly, I will buy you a ticket to go back to where you were living before because that's mm-hmm. where his family and stuff was located mm-hmm. like I I was I was trying to end it on amicable Good terms turn. in those ways and like being like look like this hurt biggest thing that sucked for me is feeling like I lost my friend but mm-hmm. ultimately when it came down to it he wasn't treating me like a friend anymore Mm-mm. Uh, even a friend would would show up. Mm-hmm. Doesn't have to be a lover. I want to specify on that. Yeah. Even a friend, a good friend, they wouldn't sugarcoat anything. If they, if you're going through abuse and your friend is telling you, "Oh, you'll be okay," they mean well. That's not your friend. Yeah. A friend would be like that dirty bastard how dare he do that to you let me go key his car like that's your friend well and <laughs> that's um, a very very grotesque example of it but um a, a friend's gonna want to fight for you exactly because they they find value in you and i can say you can also have friendships that are very toxic and abusive yes. as well oh yeah this does not just fall on partner relationships. This can come into family relationships with your parents, mm-hmm. with siblings. Abuse can happen in and so many spaces and on so many different levels. Yep. So like being able to recognize types of things that are healthy mm-hmm. and caring in a relationship. Like one of, one of my best frame points for realizing where I had dealt with so much abuse was trying to take a look at it as if it was happening to somebody else. Yeah. Because I will stand up and fight for another person or speak up about it before I will for myself most of the time. And so I started looking at situations I'd been in and be like, okay, if this person was a friend, not me, How would I feel about it for how their partner's treating them? Yeah. Like, how would I feel about how that person was treating their partner? Mm -hmm. And it's, it's taking that out kind of an outside view from the point of an observer. Mm -hmm. Right. And even in since I've realized that, because I realized that around seven years ago, six, seven years ago, um, just a couple years ago, there was situations I was having happen at work where one of my or like I had been crying at my desk (laughs) literally like a week before this because of how stressed out how much weight I was feeling put on me Mm -hmm. through my job even though like I was saying no's right yeah it was kind of being dismissed and well oh you can work it into your schedule yeah even though I was like I don't know where (laughs) um but I was on a, a work call it was during COVID and one of my other coworkers, like I could tell there was hints of distress in her voice. And so after we got off the call, I was like, how would I feel if I was her just now? And I was like, I'm going to check on her. <laughs> and yes. I went over to check on her and she's crying at her desk. And like, that was an injury. Yes. In my book, it's not the kind that most people consider an injury as far as a physical cut, scrape, burn, abrasion, broken bone, right? Mm -hmm. But it is an injury to the emotional system, to the mental system. Mm -hmm. And to me, that wasn't all right. I love that you you said like how like how would you feel looking out on it what yeah. came to my brain when you mentioned that was how would I feel about myself if I mm-hmm. was behaving that way yeah 
I'm a very integral person. My integrity is very important to me. Mm -hmm. So if anyone were to say to me that I'm making them feel a certain way that is not benefiting them, that would, that would upset me in a, a fire under my ass to be like, well, I have no idea why I was, do, you know, what I did to do that. What was I doing? What made you feel that way? Like, I want to stop doing that. And so if what someone else is doing to you and you were to put yourself in that position and doing it to them and you didn't like who you would be, why would you ever let anyone else do that to you? Mm -hmm. Easier said than done. Because uh, one thing I like to say is just because it's simple does not make it easy. Yeah. And one, one thing that keeps kind of flashing to mind for me is, um, so like, let's say you are in an abusive dynamic, right? Mm -hmm. And the other person's yelling at you, belittling you, calling names, or maybe it comes down to physical abuse. As we said, it can look many different ways. Oh, yeah. Yelling back doesn't necessarily help the situation mm -hmm. right being able to take a step away for yourself and be kind and compassionate in yourself can be much easier because when you try calling people out on their shit most yeah. people really don't like that they don't if they are an abuser they most likely cannot accept the ways they have hurt other people mm -hmm. And they may never be able to. It was one really profound um, coaching session. I actually got. To... I think you muted yourself on accident. I did. Thank you. <laughs> where did I was that... like, where'd you go? Where did that leave off? <laughs> uh, the 40 seconds before that. I have no idea what 40 seconds before that was. <laughs> Me neither. I'm trying to remember. Um. What I got from that was. Okay. What I got from that was, so around, did I mention the piece about yelling? Yes. Okay. So yelling, calling the other person out on their shit, even if you were doing that kindly, doesn't work a lot of the time because the other person is likely unable to acknowledge and actually look at the way their actions are impacting the world outside. Mm -hmm. So on your end, taking this viewpoint of like, you're going to do what's best for you. Mm -hmm. In that moment, stepping away, making space for yourself. Right. Mm -hmm. Is so, so invaluable. And to me, this came down to, a coaching practice I went through where it's a, called an aspecting process. And so it's where you are imagining a person you're wanting to have a conversation. And you're actually engaging in this conversation, right? And so yeah. for me, this was with my ex-husband or me imagining him in that space and this was all guided by a coach, which I definitely recommend if you have been through abuse, right? Or mm -hmm. trying to yeah. find healing through past relationships. Yes. Um, but I was, there was a fear edge in me, even in sitting down in this practice, because I'd sat down in aspecting practices many times before. And every single time, what I would be receiving from this imagined piece of him was just pure anger and rage like it it very rarely ever came to a more tender place well in this practice I didn't actually get to or I think I did sit down and embody him because you can eventually take the seat as that person so you can see how they feel right and reflect back to yourself on the other pillow what what you just heard all sorts of things. It's, it's a really phenomenal practice. If anybody is interested in exploring it, 
Mm-hmm. I know I have training in it and have done many of these myself. I know I've guided Rachel Rose through some of them. Oh, yeah. She's fantastic. At that. <laughs> but also, I am assuming Rachel Rose probably has the skills and ability to do that herself as well. Yes. Um, same, same, but, but different. But it was it was interesting on this one because when I sat down in that seat as my ex-husband, my whole body started feeling like I had insects crawling under my skin. Mm. And I got this really strong visual image of a little boy that looked very much like my ex-husband would have as a child sitting in a field by himself. And this was not a nice field. It was not like meadowy or anything like that. It was a very like garbagey, like gross field. <laughs> Landmine, uh, landfill. Yeah. Kind of like <laughs> a landfill. Like there's, yeah, there was garbage around. Like it wasn't pretty dried out Mm -hmm. grass like all overgrown and shabby and this little boy wouldn't even look up and the coach inquired about that and I got this image that if he even looked up at me for a second that all the mirrors would start shattering for him and for him he had never had that foundation of safety and security Yeah. Even from a very, very young age, like he may have never had that. Mm -hmm. So he may not be able to have that to go back to a resource in within himself in this lifetime. So I need to remove it as an expectation within myself that that's Mm -hmm. even possible for him. He may not be able to do that work for this lifetime. And that's okay. Yeah. It allowed me this clarity to say, like, one, to acknowledge where my own support and foundations had been that were secure mm-hmm. in relationships and support and love, but also acknowledging, like, this is where this person is at. He may not be able to come to that, and I need to be okay with that. Yes. Because that's his path. I don't need to take on his shit. I don't need to take his shit. Like I can set, I can set those boundaries for myself and being like, nope, I need to step away. Yeah. But in that it was acknowledging, like, it's not my job to like make this person see their shit either. No. And you can't, the only person that you can control in this life is yourself. You can't, you can literally be flashing it. And if I was saying this to my client the other day is like, You can literally have that knife stabbed into your gut with their hands holding the knife clearly and they're saying, oh, yeah, I did it. I stabbed her. And it won't it won't convince the world of it. You know, people Mm -hmm. won't listen. They won't even admit they were saying to you with the knife in your gut. I did this. But then when you say it. Can you just admit you did this? So, no, I did it. Mm-hmm. it's a, a lot like you know I you know you mentioned earlier about yelling back to yelling and the same concept with this um it is like two bucks that have fought that are fighting each other and they get their their antlers stuck together mm-hmm now, if this happens in the wild and someone doesn't find them to help un- unhook their antlers, they both die. Sometimes an antler can break off. That's why you'll see a lot of bucks with one antler off. And, you know, that's a blessing. You may have mm-hmm. lost the antler, but you're not dead. Yeah. But usually, it, and it's a slow and painful death. When your when your antlers get hooked, and so if you're if you're one you know yelling back to the yelling, that's going to be a cycle that will lead to death. And the same goes for needing that validation from the other person. Mm-hmm. You don't need it to walk away. You don't need them to admit what they did. You don't need that sorries. You don't need to know why you 
you know, like you, you're saying to yourself, I didn't deserve that. So why do they feel I deserved it? You don't need that answer. And, and honestly, and if fixating you do, on it, what, if, if you do feel like you need that answer, it doesn't have to come from them, from them, right? Like you can get that answer from things like aspecting processes, right. Mm-hmm. And sitting down and having these conversations, mm-hmm. you can find that forgiveness. Yeah. You can find that healing without that healing, having to directly involved them. them yeah yeah because on some level they are they are a reflection of your own shadow mm-hmm. and that's a lot of the time especially when we get drawn into toxic relationships there can be these aspects where our system is wanting to find healing it's wanting to come to wholeness Mm-hmm. And we're placing that on this relationship outside of ourself mm-hmm. rather than that wholeness already existing within ourselves. We've just fragmented it. So we're not seeing it anymore. Yeah. There's lots of mirror reflections coming up lately and it probably doesn't help that there's the, the breaking mirrors session coming up. soon. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, it's perfect. Then we need to talk about it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so do you have any any advice before before we yeah, wrap things up yeah mm-hmm. approaching letting go as an incremented task not something you do all at once is pretty critical to its success rate. Letting go of everything all at once and walking away. That if you imagine yourself, let's say, let's, let's go as just a, a lover partner that your bungee, they're holding on to this bungee cord that they've attached to your back and you're running away from them. And that's, you know, that's the pressure you've been feeling for years. You can't ever get away. Now, if you turn around and you just cut that cord, that's going to shoot you flying in the opposite direction. And you don't have the skill set, the wherewithal, the, the armor, the training, the sword skills or whatever to fight wherever it is you're going to end up landing. You don't even know if you're going to land on your feet, your head, you know, somewhere else. If you land in water, you can't swim. So doing it in increments will lessen that whiplash that happens. And I, and I urge you to, you know, get help with that, especially in, in most cases, a lot of that you could still do it in increments and it still feels like whiplash, especially if you're leaving a very abusive partner that's both mes- mentally and physically abusive. Um, just the, the, the sheer physical moving out could, could feel like cutting that cord that shoots you flying. So having a game plan and working with someone to help make a game plan to do it gradually that healing letting go process after the fact is is really important you don't have to do it all at once i think also validating even like the small wins in ways that you have been able to let go whether that is in relationships or other areas of life Mm -hmm. and where you've been able to do that like with ease Right. So I want to say that most of us generate trash, especially from food products or packaging Mm -hmm. on products. How hard is it for you to let go of that piece of garbage? Like, do you just throw it in the garbage can? Is there an emotional struggle? Right. Mm -hmm. But there is some place in your life where you can let go easily. Mm -hmm. Right. There's bigger areas in your life where you can let go easily. And so validating those little spaces, acknowledging what those are for you can be huge in you realizing that like, 
you also have the strength to let go of the things that feel bigger. Mm -hmm. Because that's you, you all, each and every one of you, me and Rachel Rose included, have immense power and immense strength in being able Mm -hmm. to hold ourselves and support ourselves to find the supports that are really going to nurture us. Yes. But the more we're holding on to those past things, the harder it can be to see when those supports are there. Mm -hmm. Right. But also the less room, it's kind of like hoarding, right? Oh yeah. Emotionally hoarding. And that's, you, you can use many, many different tools. Like I actually just went through a really beautiful breath work practice earlier and even halfway through it, I was like, well, I don't know how profound this is going to be. And by the end of it, I was like rolling on the floor crying and like, but it was out of a space of like immense joy. Oddly (laughs) enough, it was around feeling supported. Oh, beautiful. Right. It was, I actually got the visual image and like full body sensations of being like held and wrapped in wings Mm -hmm. and then getting to see all these people who are big supports in my life, like come forward and like get down on like their hands and knees and just hold me. And it was, it was phenomenal to get to experience that. And like, I I don't know, words aren't accurate for describing some of those experiences. Right. But (laughs) they're limited in their capabilities, but it was, exactly what I needed and I had no idea what was going to come up during that breathwork session there was just the simple intention of I want to feel supported yeah beautiful yeah so intention intention validating where you have been able to do these things like with ease or with fun and playfulness mm-hmm. right And then allowing yourself to come back to that North star of what your intention was Mm -hmm. and being able to receive it, like opening that space to, to be able to receive it. Cause that can feel uncomfortable, especially when you've been sustaining off of breadcrumbs. Mm -hmm. And, and like, like Alex was saying is use that childlike creativity and, and balance with the more logical, you know, game plans, I have to get this, this, and this done in order to get my healing started or going Mm -hmm. or whatever. Having that balance will make it feel so much like a chore. And then you start having fun with that healing process. Like Alex was saying, she's happy crying and feels that safety. Yeah. And that's, I, I wasn't able to happy cry until I actually started letting myself sad cry. Yes. Yes. You got to feel all of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No. And again, if any of you would like guidance, you can find links for Rachel Rose and I in the about section on YouTube also posted under the video and You can follow us on social media, whatever feels appropriate for you and what you're needing, but know that we are here to support you. Either way. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. And do you have anything else you want to touch on before we head out? I do not believe so. Tune with us again next Thursday at 1 p.m. PST. Yeah. And next Thursday, we are going to be talking about, or it's called Bloom. Finding love after toxic relationships. So mm-hmm. I'm excited for that one. I was super excited for this one too. I'm excited <laughs> for all of them too. I feel you. <laughs> I love this space. Thank you for sharing. That yes. With you. And thank you for anyone who joins us at any point in the future. And we'd love to hear any comments, feedback, questions, anything you may have. Yes. All right. Beautiful. Well, have a great rest of your day, Rachel Rose, and anyone out there who is listening. You as well, everyone, and you as well, Alex. All right. (laughs) Bye. Bye.